From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. It's not your everyday $12.8 billion state budget. The McKee administration unveiled their tax and spend plan on Thursday with the added bonus of a $618 million budget surplus, oh, and a billion dollars in federal COVID relief funds. What you need to know on how all that money could be spent. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. In for Ted Nisi this week is my Target 12 colleague, Eli Sherman. And joining us to talk about that and a whole lot more is Commerce Secretary Stephen Pryor. He's on the left side of your screen. Good to and be with And we you. have uh, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Brian Daniels. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank Appreciate you for having us. having us. A lot to talk about. Brian, uh, Director, I'm going to start with you. Uh, the federal money aside, okay, there is a decent budget surplus, as I said at the top of the show, 618 million dollars and and we're going to get into in the next half hour how the governor wants to spend all of this money but i do wonder if there was a discussion about giving some money back to the people in some form of tax relief it's a great question um so the reason for the 600 plus million dollar um Budget surplus, as, you've, as you know, this is not a normal amount. We don't normally see these types of surpluses in Rhode Island. Um, it's, it's the result of a number of factors. Part of it is that our economy is coming back very strong. Uh, so we have the opportunity to make some one-time investments. The problem with, uh, the important thing about using $600 million in one-time investments is that it allows us to address problems that have been deferred or ignored for a long time in state government. Um, but it's one-time money, and I think that's the thing that people need to recognize, is that we're, we can't guarantee that that $600 million will come back in future years. And for that reason, we want to make sure that they're one-time investments. If we did uh, new programs or if we did tax cuts, those would have lingering effects in the out years. And we're tax actually, cuts could be one-time, though, couldn't they? Well, they could be, yeah. But I think the, the focus is trying to make sure that we invest in all of the problems that we haven't, ha uh, that we haven't been able to afford in the past. And in many cases, those, uh, fixing those problems do have out-year benefits for the, for the budget. So our de deficit is actually declining in the out years. This is the first time we've seen that in a really long time. And that actually ultimately benefits the taxpayers. And, Secretary, it's sort of a similar question to you. Sure. Um, there's a, again, that budget surplus and the governor is proposing dropping the corporate minimum tax, but it's, it's really kind of small. It's 500 to 475 dollars. That's 25 dollars. Uh, it's a, a 400 to 375, yes. Thank you. Yep. 400, no but problem. it's a 25 dollar uh, deduction. Your goal is to obviously grow commerce in the state. Again, similar question, wouldn't lowering corporate taxes or taxes on small businesses help to do that? There are actually four tax moves that are important that were accomplished for small business in this budget proposal. There's the lowering of the corporate minimum, which by the way, since 2016, we've lowered a bunch of times from 500 all the way down to 375. So it is making a difference for small businesses. And I'll, I'll note for you, Ted, every business pays it, pays it even if they're not profitable. Very quickly though, we enable towns to lower the tangible tax on equipment and furniture for the first time without an act of the General Assembly. That's what's currently required for a municipality to exempt or lower the tangible tax. We're gonna let them do those exemptions for small businesses. And uh, we are adding a, tax, a taxpayer emissary in the budget that enables uh, businesses to actually go to someone in the tax office who's an advocate for them. So we're very proud of all of those moves. Finally, there's a penalty on late taxes. In the midst of the pandemic, businesses, including small businesses, are, are paying 18%, which, which some would call like a usury level, totally unfair in this tough time. We're lowering that to 12% to equal our neighbor Connecticut and be competitive with the overall region. Very good, sound tax moves for small businesses. Real quick, and by the way, Ted is the other guy, I'm Tim, but uh, the- uh, Oh, my apologies. <laughs> okay, uh, is that a one-time lowering of that or is that permanent, the-, the Those would be permanent changes. Okay, Eli? Uh, so I wanna to turn to housing, which is of course the biggest expense out of the $1 billion that's been allocated for the ARPA money. Um, the biggest bucket is $250 million for housing, and $90 million of that is going to be going towards affordable housing. And so when we talk about affordable housing, what do we mean specifically, and how long do you think it'll take to create the 1,500 units that you're expecting to build or create under that money? Sure, I guess I'll take that okay. first. Um, Eli, uh, the $90 million, which is part of a quarter billion dollar investment in housing, is for the production and preservation of housing, affordable housing in particular. That means up to 80% of area median income. Really the way to think about that is lower income housing. 
uh, housing for people who are struggling financially. Uh, there are monies, additional monies, including $20 million for workforce housing, which is uh, police officers, teachers, firefighters, nurses. Uh, there will be housing that we help to produce for that purpose as well. But we have an intensive focus on affordable housing because we know that with this very tight housing market we have, with people moving in from out of state during the pandemic, recognizing that Rhode Island's a great place to live, we're squeezing up and down the market the ability to, to find housing that people want, and it especially impacts lower income Rhode Islanders. So assuming it, that there is this squeeze and it's happening right now, how long are we talking about for 1,500 units? Or can we expect that to start happening immediately after the budget is approved by the General Assembly? Or are we talking years out that we're gonna have these the, Fortunately, these houses? thanks to Governor McKee's advocacy and Speaker Shikarshi and Senate President Ruggiero's approval and enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastic approval, we have a down payment, meaning that we've already freed up $15 million for new investments in this particular domain, affordable housing production. We've already uh, allocated $31 million out, out of a previous bond that the voters approved for affordable housing production, the biggest single year allocation we've had on record that anyone can remember anyway. So all these numbers add up to a lot, and we've gotten some of these projects already approved and we're getting them underway. Now, Eli, you are correctly pointing out, you don't flick a switch and housing units arise out of the ground. There has to be sites acquired in some cases, other layers of financing lined up. They have to break ground, they have to build the thing. So it could be 18 to 24 months, even once there are all the approvals, to get the housing all the way done. Rehabilitation might take a little bit shorter. That's why we needed the down payment and we're getting some of this going thanks to our leaders. Well, Secretary, let's stick with you on that. And Director, we'll get to you in a, in a moment, but just, you know, uh, when you're looking at, as Eli said, 1,500 apartment units, where are we looking? Where, where do you think those are going to be built? We're hoping it'll be really across the state. We have, in various ways, taken a look by, we've consulted uh, through the League of Cities and Towns with uh, the different uh, towns as to their available land for new construction, whether it be for residential or industrial. Brian knows a thing or two about that. <laughs> uh, and we've also uh, been talking directly with municipal leaders, mayors, and town managers about what they'd like to do. Some, t some towns in, in our state, Central Falls is, is a city that's exemplary, they put plans together so they're ready to go. So that's how we're gonna get it done, through the municipalities. Are you, spending on planning, are you planning on spending any of this money, any of the housing money on the Superman building? No, none of, none of this housing money. So I will say that I mean, there's, there's activity a big empty going building. on around the Superman building to, building to try to bring it back, not, not this affordable housing and workforce housing money. So, any of the 250 million though? No. Okay, so no apartments in, in a, uh, not to be flippant, but in a big empty building in downtown Providence. No, I'll say this. We do aim to bring the Superman building back to life. There are negotiations underway for that purpose. We do aim to include an affordable component and a workforce housing component, and that will require financing. Uh, but this package is going through the regular bu budget process and will pass in June, and quite frankly, we're in the midst of discussions now, and uh, we're not planning to tap these monies. All right, uh, Director, I'm gonna shift to you on, ed on education and something you know a lot about from your old hat at the League of Cities and Towns. Um, and the budget is technically not changing the school funding form formula, but it includes level funding for schools, um, even for communities where enrollment has dropped, which I'm sure is welcome news for districts, but isn't that in effect changing the funding formula because communities that saw enrollments decline are getting more money per pupil? It's a great question. So as you know, a number of school districts are experiencing lower enrollment because of the pandemic. Uh, parents are keeping children home. They're finding alternate um, uh, educational opportunities uh, for, the, for their children. We don't know how permanent that is. That's what we're trying to figure out. And until until children are, can be completely vaccinated, can be in schools, and schools are operating regularly, we won't know what the enrollment numbers are like. So similar to the budget that passed last year with the General Assembly, we do have hold harmless language to make sure that no school district uh, receives less school aid because of enrollment. Uh, if we didn't have that, school districts would receive about uh, $50 million less. That would be a big hit to them. Uh, especially because they need to maintain the infrastructure, the teachers, and so forth, um, as they find out what future enrollment is going to look like. So the $50 million number you gave, that's a calculation if you were to uh, account for the decline in enrollment. Correct. Um, you sort of touched on it, but that, you know, there is no 
indication necessarily that enrollment will bounce back. So should schools be tightening their belts now because this well could run dry? I think we do need to look at that in the longer term to figure out what the enrollment trends are going to be. However, because schools are not fully operational in all communities, we were concerned about um, having communities take that hit now. And when we have a better sense of what uh, when school operations get back to normal and everyone's back in the classroom, we can have the conversation about if we need to make any adjustments from there. In, in education, there's 15 million that's been allocated for municipal learning programs, which of course um, is a program that, an after school program like this uh, program that the go governor started in Cumberland when he was mayor there. Um, the idea is to establish 11 programs with that $15 million. Where would those be set up and uh, who do you envision paying for the cost of operating those down the road? Does that then get kicked to the municipalities? It's a great question. So um, it actually works hand in hand with another component of the budget proposal. There is about $47 million in federal capital funds that could be used to create uh, community wellness centers in our cities and towns. So the way the municipal learning centers could be envisioned, it would vary by community, um, but you're right, the main purpose is to make sure that children have access to educational programming and activities um, after school. So after school, weekends, vacation, during the summer, um, what that looks like in each community is going to be different. So sometimes there will be partnerships with nonprofits. Sometimes there can be partnerships with corporate sponsors or universities, depending on um, who's interested in the community to have those types of partnerships. I know the governor's office has been engaged with a lot of municipal leaders to find out um, what municipal learning centers would look like in each community, but it will vary depending on the individual needs. Do either of you know if ILO Group will be spearheading the municipal learning program? Uh, we have not made any uh, decisions on that. Obviously, as you know, the funding would have to be appropriated, and then there would be, uh, if it is appropriated, we would go through uh, a standard procurement process to, to see how that rolls out. And there are 11 programs. Is that 11 communities, or are we talking just 11 programs, maybe half are in Providence? So the, my understanding, I've not seen the full list, but I, my understanding is that there are 11 communities that have expressed interest. I think one community might have uh, two locations it's looking at. Um, but the intent is really to spread it across as many communities as possible. There are 11 that have expressed interest, but I know that there's an ongoing conversation with municipal leaders. Secretary, we have to go to a break in about a minute or so, but yes. um, I do want to pivot briefly back to housing. Mm -hmm. Uh, before we do, uh, 17500 in down payment money for eligible prospective home buyers are in the proposed budget. Um, I assume this will be largely based on household income. Do you have yes. a sense as to what that threshold would be? Uh, we're still looking at possibilities. Uh, there's a, a figure we've been looking at as a, as a guidepost, $115,000 for uh, three-person households is a good guidepost for uh, where affordability needs to kick in to help bring some people across the line, but we haven't made decisions yet. I'll note also we want to flex um, the, um, the credit score for families that may be struggling a bit because they're right at the line. 709 is the credit score that's average in Rhode Island. We'd like to allow with people with a, a little bit more frailty in their credit score to get across the line. Bottom line is more flexibility on income and credit score. Uh, so with the credit score, you'd have to work with the banks, right, to, to be able to drop that threshold. We would. That's where our investment, our subsidy may be helpful to, to say to them, okay, this is a more affordable loan for them to make so they can provide more flexibility. Okay, we're going to take a break in the program. Still a lot to talk about in the budget proposal, including potentially big spending at the problem-plagued Eleanor Slater Hospital System. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. In for, uh, in for Ted Nisi this week is Eli Sherman from Target 12. And our guests this week, Stephen Pryor. He's the Rhode Island Commerce Secretary and Director of the Rhode Island Office of Management and Budget is Brian Daniels. Secretary, uh, we are going to get back to the budget, which is why you're, we are here. But um, I have to ask you this politics question. There's a lot of talk that you may run for treasurer. Are you still considering that? You know, I remain focused on my duties as Commerce Secretary, and really I'm not thinking about anything with intensity right now beyond that. You can see we just spent several days rolling out our budget, 
It's really, as Brian would point out, three budgets, including <laughs> all of the American Rescue Plan money. So I'm very focused, and we've even referred to some big projects we're working on today. So that's where my head is right now. Well, having asked that question a lot over the last 24 years, um, what I didn't hear is a no uh, you know, in there. So that suggests to the people at home that you are considering that. So uh, you know, that being said, in your mind, when do you have to decide? What's the timeline for you? Look, I'm, I'm not ruling out possibilities, but I, I, I'm very serious about the fact that we're, we're launching some key programs that are helping our recovery sustain itself in Rhode Island. We're blessed that through a lot of hard work by this government and a lot of people, we have the, the fastest and strongest recovery in the Northeast right now. We've got to stay that way. So I'm, I'm not rushing anything and I'm not ruling anything out. Okay, Eli. Director, uh, we want to go back to the budget now. And one of the big ticket items in this budget is $108 million expenditure on Eleanor Slater Hospital, uh, which is the state-run psychiatric and behavioral health uh, hospital. Now, the, the new facility that this money would be going towards would replace Zamborano unit in Burraville. And um, a similar proposal came out in the budget last year, and it ultimately got next uh, before the end, it was concluded, that cost estimate was $65 million. It's now $108 million. Why are we seeing uh, such a large increase just from last year? It's a great question. Um, and this is, the investment in Zambrano is one of the important one-time investments that the governor proposes from the surplus. These are the types of initiatives, the types of projects and state uh, run initiatives that have just been underfunded for years and years. And you see that when you go to the campus. Uh, you have people at Zamborano who have extremely complicated medical conditions, uh, traumatic brain injury, dementia, people on ventilators. Um, it's, it's where they, they have to get their care and we've not invested. So last year's budget uh, predated me. As you know, I'm only here for, I've been here for three months. But my understanding is that there was some uncertainty about the scope of the project and also some billing questions. So Director Charest, uh, who is the director of our Department of Behavioral Health, Developmental Disabilities and Hospitals, has spent a lot of time taking a look at the options. And we may need to, we want to have a realistic uh, proposal uh, for Zamborano. Um, because we need to do it right. We need to make sure that we are making the appropriate investments. We don't want to, to lowball the estimate to, to get it through the General Assembly and then say, oh, well, it's actually going to be a lot more. So we're still figuring out what that scope is going to be. We think it's about $108 million. It might be more, it might be less, uh, but it's really important to, to put this $100 million investment um, for a facility that has been under underinvested for a very long time. Director, just a follow-up question on this. As Eli said, the there's the physical change, you're gonna build a new yeah. hospital, you're proposing to build a new hospital uh, up in Boroughville. Uh, for folks at home to understand, there's also the Cranston campus and Eleanor Slater, and there's the forensic or the psychiatric facility uh, down there. Um, and, you know, with the building of a new facility aside, and granted this is a little bit complicated, but it is very important because it all it comes down to patient billing. Um, the idea here, correct, is to separate and do a standalone psychiatric or forensic hospital, and it all comes down to, to billing to the federal government, to Medicare. You can't have too many forensic patients. The mix is off, you stop, and the state has lost uh, federal funding because of that. So you build a whole new hospital and you, you, you have the medical patients up there, but that means that you're gonna have a standalone psychiatric unit down, I assume, in Cranston, that the state is going to have to fully fund. I imagine that is not going to be cheap for taxpayers. Well, it nets out generally positive. It's a great question, Tim, and it's important. And I think one of the reasons um, we've had challenges with Zamborano and Eleanor Slater in general is that you're right, we've had to keep that patient mix. In order to get Medicaid billing, we needed to have uh, more than 50% of the patients be, be uh, medical and not psychiatric. So this is our way of, of right-sizing the system, making sure we create a standalone psychiatric hospital. The good news is we, had, we haven't been billing for Medicaid as much as we could have been before. So th these aren't necessarily new costs by creating this new standalone psychiatric hospital. Once we do that, we can make sure that we are maximizing our billing for the medical patients. Uh, and the ultimate goal will be Zamborano has all of the medical patients and that the forensic patients and psychiatric patients are at the Beasley unit in, uh, in Cranston. To that uh, point, Director, the, right now we're not billing the federal government because 
the uh, state is out of compliance with its patient mix at the hospital. When does the budget assume that those costs will, that, that billing can resume? So it's a, the director of Charest has done a really great job going back and finding out uh, there were billing opportunities that the state did not take advantage of. So we have been doing some retro billing. Uh, there have been some improvements. So for example, people who are 20, uh, 65 or older do qualify for some federal reimbursement. So we've been maximizing that. Um, so we have actually started to get some billing for patients that we thought did not qualify. Uh, so we do have some funds in the budget to account for that, but ultimately when we do break out the two different hospitals and make sure that psychiatric is a standalone unit, then we will be able to fully maximize our uh, Medicaid billing. So Sec this fall? Uh, is that the idea? So the, the expectation is that the, um, I believe the psychiatric, uh, there's a certificate of need process that the psychiatric hospital needs to go through. Uh, they're hoping to do that in the fall uh, with potentially billing, full billing starting in the fall or probably a little bit later um, around January. Secretary, $132 million proposed for climate change yes. related projects. What does that look like? It, it, there are some really remarkable investments that are proposed. We're excited about it. Let's start with offshore wind and the blue economy. Uh, that intersects with climate, of course, because we are making our electric grid uh, green. And we're leading the nation with the first deployment of offshore wind turbines, but we can't rest on our laurels there. We have a real opportunity. The limiting factor on the growth of the offshore wind industry in the Northeast and frankly up and down the East Coast, it's port land, it's operational seaports. Now we've got Quonset and Proudport in the act, it's not enough. And even if we add New Bedford in Massachusetts and New London in Connecticut within this larger region, it's not enough to build out the, the turbines that need to occur. So we're gonna build a brand new port at East Providence at South Key. We're gonna put $35 million into play on top of some previously committed investments. Um, and we're gonna put $60 million into Quonset, um, including some new lay down area and some stabilization there as well. So that's incredibly exciting. We're also gonna do things like uh, electric, electric vehicle charging stations all around Rhode Island to make sure that we modernize in that way. And we're gonna invest in the areas that we prioritize through the, the act on climate to make sure that we hit our greenhouse greenhouse gas and our uh, green grid goals. So this is an exciting moment. And as a commerce guy, I'm excited because it really does move the economy in areas like the offshore wind industry. Eli? Uh, Director, back to you. The state is estimating about $44.7 million in cost savings this fiscal year. It's going to the surplus. Uh, in large part because agencies are struggling to fill open positions, something that we talked about this week. That's a pain point that obviously the state is feeling as well as plenty of private industries right now. What agencies in state government right now are being hit hardest by this? It's a good question. I think you see it particularly in, the, in a lot of our health and human services agencies. Uh, DCYF has uh, been trying to fill positions uh, for uh, support staff and childcare workers uh, and uh, social workers. We have not been able to fill some of those positions. You see it very, uh, it's evident in our veterans home and in Eleanor Slater Hospital where we can't find uh, qualified medical people uh, to, to work these jobs. This is, as you pointed out, this is a problem facing all of healthcare, um, many employers throughout the state. Uh, it's a challenge and we do hope to have some incentives in the, in the federal funds that will improve um, healthcare uh, workforce retention as well as uh, for the for state as well as private uh, employers. So are there opportunities there then to to eliminate some positions or are you going to be seeking to to refill all of them? We're looking to I mean most of the positions that that are vacant are essential so we need to make sure we have nurses in our hospitals uh, we need to have support staff at our veterans home we need to make sure we have um, caseworkers at DCYF so we need to make sure that those essential positions are filled. I know there is uh, a desire to take a look at our classification and compensation in the state to find out can we um, change the way we uh, pay, our, pay our employees, see if there are ways of modernizing our workforce, but our immediate goal right now is to fill those vacancies. All right, Secretary, we have about a minute and a half left in the yes. program, and I, I gotta ask you about Dr. Nicole Alexander-Scott. You worked with her very closely yes. throughout the pandemic. Uh, she is now leaving, as is Tom McCarthy. He announced this week that he is out. How disruptive are these high profile exits from the Department of Health right now? Oh, I, I wouldn't say that they are disruptive. I would say that um, it's uh, 
it's marvelous to see the amount of co accomplishment that Dr. Alexander Scott and, uh, and Mr. McCarthy have accomplished. They've just done so much to move us forward. Um, and I've been astounded by their ability over 24 hour periods, nonstop, barely with any sleep to, to advocate and to get the job done for Rhode Islanders. And um, so I think there'll be an opportunity to bring in some new talent, which is, you know, brings uh, additional energy. But I have to say, these folks will be very hard acts to follow. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Alexander Scott is inspiring. I think that Rhode Islanders know from her uh, outward presentations at press conferences at the podium, she cares so deeply about individuals, about the health of Rhode Islanders. She was a staunch advocate of doing the right thing by public health at every turn. It was really a privilege to work alongside her, sometimes to debate, to reach something that would work in the market, work for businesses, work for Rhode Island as a whole, but bless them both. All right, we uh, have to end the show, but there's a lot to digest in the budget. Make sure you check out Eli's full report on WPRI.com. Thanks for watching Newsmakers. We'll see you next week.